that one. of this year's development report of the Asia Pacific countries with special needs titled Leveraging Ocean Resources for Sustainable Development of Small Islands Developing States. The report, a summary of which was discussed at the recent ESCAP Commission session on the 21st of May, identifies how small islands developing states or SITs in Asia Pacific can use ocean resources sustainably to build back better after COVID-19. I am Josefa Mayava, Head of the Pacific Office of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, and I will be moderating today's session. To introduce the report, I am delighted we have one of its authors, Mr. Oliver Pattison, ESCAP's Chief of Section Responsible for all things related to countries with special needs at, at ESCAP, including SITS. And to respond to the report, I am particularly pleased to welcome Mr. Chris Cocker, the Chief Executive Officer of the Pacific Tourism Organization, and Mr. Transform Agorao, CEO, Ituna Intel and Foundation and Director of Pacific Catalyst, also the former head of the Parties to the Nauru Agreement, legal counsel and, uh, and uh, legal advisor for the uh, Forum Fisheries Agency and the Pacific Islands Forum Secretary. Oliver will begin by providing an overview of the report and its key findings before I invite the other panelists to respond. We will then move on to a question and uh, uh, discussion and question and answer session. Uh, you can uh, ask questions while the presentation is ongoing through the YouTube channel to which there are links on the UN SCAP website. Or you can send us an email, scas at un.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at UNSCAP, pound CSN report. We will collect your questions and feed them into the discussion. Oliver? Over to you for your overview presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Josefa. Thank you for, for the introductory remarks. Um, let me move on to the presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers, it is my pleasure today to provide an overview of the Asia Pacific Countries with Special Needs Development Report, which is entitled Leveraging Ocean Resources for Sustainable Development of Small Island Developing States. This report is one of ESCAP's flagship publications. The report series focuses only on countries with special needs, which was a group of countries compromising least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states, SIDS for short. We focus on these countries as they lag behind the other developing countries in the region in various aspects. For example, in these developed countries, the rate of extreme poverty today is more than twice the average of developing Asian Pacific economies. The landlocked nature of other developing countries and the small island nature of SIDS have also presented significant challenges to their development. This report series was first produced in 2015, where we studied how to build productive capacities and facilitate diversification in these countries. Since then, we have covered various themes such as infrastructure development and financing for infrastructure, the interlinkage between peace and sustainable development and structural transformation and its role in reducing poverty. I'd certainly encourage you to visit our website and look at these reports. Let me turn to this year's report and the key messages of this presentation. Although Asia Pacific small island developing states have made progress towards individual goals, they are overall lagging in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As we know, SIDS must contend with several challenges. Many of these relate to their smallness and geographic isolation. However, what we emphasize is that these economies 
have great potential to benefit more from the blue economy. In particular, we focus in the report on the role that fisheries and tourism can play as drivers of sustainable development in SIDS. Yet, at the same time, we point out that many of the lessons learned, especially from tourism, are also valid for the landlocked developing countries in Central Asia and beyond, where the unique geography of high passes and mountains, vast deserts, grassy steppes, and rich cultures appeals to visitors. Overall, tourism and fisheries must be better integrated into local economies and with populations. Countries need to enhance international and regional cooperation and ensure sustainability of these sectors. In addition, better access to factual, transparent and harmonized data and better enforcement of international frameworks, norms and standards would go a long way in making the development of these sectors more sustainable. Finally, considering the ongoing pandemic, the report highlights that in the short term, addressing the consequence of COVID-19 must take priority. Targeted fiscal and monetary support measures will be necessary to support affected businesses, such as in tourism related services and in fisheries. However, the pandemic may provide a historic opportunity to advocate for change for a more inclusive and sustainable future and to better respond to future crises. The first chapter of our report highlights why ocean resources are critical for the sustainable development of small island developing states. With almost a third of the implementation period of the 2030 agenda having passed, stock taking of available data suggests that SIDS are on track to reach goal nine, which is aimed at building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. Significant process, progress has also been made in reaching goal three on ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all. As a group, insufficient progress has however been made for most other goals. Importantly, SIDS have regressed in promoting inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work for all, that is goal eight. While the COVID-19 pandemic is still underway, it is already becoming evident that many of these economies will regress further from reaching goal eight. And this goal is important because without sustainable growth and the availability of decent work, countries will not be able to reach many of the other goals. Although SIDS generally cover small areas of land, often dispersed across hundreds of islands, many have large exclusive economic zones, ENEZs as we call them. These are areas over which they have exclusive rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing natural resources. Now the EECs of several SIDS exceed their land area by several thousand times, as we demonstrate here. To put this into perspective, the EEZ of Kiribati, which has a population of less than 12,000 people, covers an area that is greater than the land area of Kazakhstan, a nation of 18 million people, and which is in fact the largest landlocked country in the world. Compared with their land areas, these EEZs are vast, as are the resources that are in these zones. The abundance of these resources must, however, be leveraged more effectively to support sustainable development. Chapter two of the report focuses on fisheries as a driver for sustainable development. Fisheries, which can be broken down into offshore, coastal, aquaculture, and freshwater fisheries, are extremely valuable for SIDS. We can see that offshore fisheries in the Pacific is by far the most important of these in terms of value of fisheries production. In fact, the Pacific subregion provides approximately 55% of the world's tuna supply. Overall, fisheries provides employment, government revenue and food, thereby contributing to reducing household poverty in the region. Access fees that vessels from distant water fishing nations are charged for fishing in SIDS EZs are often the main source of public revenue for many governments. Fisheries contributes as much as 75% of government revenue in Kiribati. In Asia and the Pacific, the health of oceans in general and fisheries in particular is fragile and the challenges of sustainably managing fisheries are intricately linked to the sustainable conservation of oceans. An important threat to fisheries is of course overfishing as the very nature of fisheries as a common property resource that is depletable constitutes the true tragedy of the commons. This we highlight explains the overexploitation of coastal fisheries and in the high seas. Climate change is also a significant challenge. Warmer air and sea surface temperatures, ocean acidification, rising sea levels, and greater rainfall are expected to cause significant losses of coral reef, 
mangrove and intertidal habitats. And these provide important shelter and food for coastal fish and shellfish. Another expected impact is that the main tuna stocks may move towards the high seas out of the exclusive economic zones of many sits. This highlights again that the impact of climate change on fisheries is asymmetrical between those who suffer its effects and those who cost it. Institutional or regulatory features may also have a considerable influence. For instance, climate change mitigation requires global collaboration among countries, and this clearly remains insufficient today. Despite the importance of fisheries to the economies and social well being of Asia Pacific communities, particularly those of SIDS, substantial data gaps remain, preventing the effective management of fisheries. For instance, there are no data available for fishery related sustainable development goal 14 targets, except one which is 14.4 sustainable fish stocks. So if we look at some recommendations of this chapter to address these challenges, we do put several forward. For one, conservation projects are needed to prevent the depletion of stocks and to preserve natural environments. Marine protected areas and the improved monitoring of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing can play an important role. Statistic systems must also be strengthened to ensure that factual, transparent and harmonized data and information is available to effectively manage fisheries. Governance must be improved to ensure that global conventions are effectively implemented. Doing so requires engaging all ocean stakeholders, and this would in fact foster a sense of ownership and possibly increase awareness of the consequences of marine resource depletion. Finally, we point out in the report that regional cooperation is especially important given the nature of fisheries as a common property resource. There are two initiatives that we highlight, for instance, that have been quite successful on a sub-regional level for managing fisheries. These are the harmonized minimum terms and conditions of foreign fishing vessel access, which specifies consistent conditions across the sub-region of the Pacific, and the Nauru Agreement, which introduced the Vessel Day Scheme, which has been instrumental in, in um, fishing stocks and EEZs. I'd like to now turn to tourism as a driver for sustainable development. As we know, the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has already been felt through a sharp decline of international inbound visitors to Asia Pacific cities due to quarantine measures, travel bans and border closures, both in tourist source countries as well as in destinations. Many cruise lines have been forced to temporarily, temporarily shut down their operations in a bid to reduce the spread of the virus. According to the latest estimates, international tourist arrivals would decline by between 60 to 80 percent globally in 2020. This would translate into a loss of between 910 billion and 1.2 trillion in tourist receipts globally. Now, ESCAP has established a website dedicated to providing updated information on the pandemic situation in Asia and the Pacific. We've also written a number of policy briefs and blogs. Um, and for those who are interested, I've put a link here on the website to the slide, a link on the slide to this website. In the medium to long term, however, the report highlights that Asia Pacific small island developing states have several opportunities to further develop the tourism sector, particularly with regard to increasing disposable income of a growing middle class in Asia and the Pacific. Tourism clearly remains an important driver of economic growth. It could increase economic activity, create and sustain jobs, attract investment and reduce poverty. For Asia Pacific cities, tourism is one of the most economically viable sectors, and I say this despite the short term, short term disruptions caused by the pandemic. Tourism is already the largest economic sector in the Cook Islands, Fiji, Maldives, Palau, and Vanuatu. In 2018, tourism employment comprised 45% of Palau's workforce, as we can see on the left hand graph, and it exceeded a workforce, um, a third of the workforce in Nui, Cook Islands, Vanuatu, and Fiji. Uh, moreover, growth of international arrivals to Asia Pacific cities was significantly higher than for other subregions in the world, and it increased in the Pacific region by more than 86% during the decade up, leading up to 2018. There are, of course, several challenges related to the sustainability of the tourism sector. These include economic sustainability, 
which depends on the strength of linkages between tourism oriented sectors and other sectors. In many economies, for instance, tourism remains an enclave industry with few backward linkages to other domestic activities. A second challenge relates to the concern about environmental sustainability as overexploitation by the tourism sector can threaten fragile ecosystems. And a third challenge is social cultural sustainability, which is particularly relevant for Pacific cities where diverse and unique indigenous cultures may come under threat through the negative impact of over tourism. Turning to policy recommendations, the report highlights that the link between local populations and the tourism sector should be strengthened to enable local communities to benefit more. This means not only building backward and forward linkages, but also developing local content intensive tourism types, such as marine tourism and culture based tourism. Countries should also consider generating additional revenues by introducing green taxes, fees and other special mechanisms with an explicit objective of supporting environmental conservation. There are a number of good examples that can be followed and we highlight these in the report. Finally, regional cooperation should promote a common Pacific brand to raise the global profile, to improve connectivity and to enhance collaboration among states to address gaps and loopholes in revenue generation. For instance, regional cooperation can be useful to collectively explore a small Pacific wide common sustainable development fee on inbound tourism. Coming to the overall conclusions of the Asia Pacific countries of special need development report, we point out that while Asia Pacific cities have made progress towards some of the sustainable development goals, now is the time to accelerate action to implement the 2030 agenda. Fostering their tourism and fishery sectors is a promising way forward for cities to capitalize on their natural endowments. There are, however, several overarching challenges that need to be overcome. One is the need to better integrate these two sectors into their local economies so that there are more linkages to other sectors and so that benefits of these sectors are more widely shared. Part and parcel of this is, of course, that steps must be taken to ensure the sustainability of these crucial sectors. For one, this re requires that international and regional cooperation is enhanced. The Nauru Agreement concerning cooperation in the management of fisheries of common interest is, for instance, an example of successful cooperation. Another step is related to the lack of factual, transparent and harmonized data. Such data are necessary to fully understand the status of fish stocks and fishery practices and to effectively manage the sector. Finally, the numerous international instruments that have been put in place to create amb ambitious targets for the protection and sustainable use of ocean resources need to turn into tangible results. This, however, depends on government abilities to enforce rules and to anchor time bound targets in national regulatory frameworks. In the short term, the priority is, of course, to address the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, this provides a historic opportunity to advocate for change for macroeconomic choices that are pro-environment, pro-climate and pro-poor and that place people's rights at the center. Also, greater investment in public services can be called for, calling for fiscal policies and other measures that curb equality. If it spurs progress on the global roadmap for a more inclusive and sustainable future, it may provide the opportunity to better respond to future crises. So I'll end my presentation here. Um, I thank you for your, for your attention. And uh, if you would like to pose any questions, here is the link um, taking you to the website or the email address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver, for that uh, uh, clear and comprehensive overview of the report. Um, may I now invite um, Chris and Transform to turn on their cameras? All right, thank you very much. Chris, uh, could I now hand over to you to respond from your perspective uh, on what the report says about uh, tourism in SITS or in the Pacific uh, Islands, and perhaps uh, provide an update on the impact of COVID-19 
in the Pacific since this report was uh, completed uh, before the impact of uh, COVID-19 was made uh, much more clearer than, than it is now. Thank you, uh, Josefa, and warm Pacific greetings from SPTO. Um, I'm Chris Cocker and the CEO of the Pacific Tourism Organization. And first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate UNESCO for launching this valuable report during this uh, challenging uh, times that we are facing. And on behalf of SPTO, I'd also like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this auspicious event. The timing of the report launch is crucial because tourism is the hardest hit sector globally and within the Asia Pacific region. And the following key areas um, are areas that will probably that I'll highlight in my response are important areas that we value from SPTO, uh, especially from this report. But before I, I continue, I just want to give a brief of who SPTO is so that, um, that those who do not know who we are, I have a better understanding. We're intergovernmental body for tourism, marketing and development in the Pacific. And our vision is our Pacific Islands empowered and benefiting from sustainable tourism. So we have strategic partners from international partners right through to NGOs. We have 145 private sector members and we have 20 Pacific Island country members ranging from Rapa Nui in the east to Marshall Islands in the north and to Timor Leste in the west and to the Kingdom of Tonga in the south. One of the things that I'd like to highlight is especially um, alluded by uh, Yosefa is uh, the, what is the impact of COVID-19 in our Pacific Island countries. And SPTO and the New Zealand MFET um, produced a report a month ago on Pacific tourism COVID-19 impact in the Pacific region. And without doubt, tourism has been one of the hardest hit sectors um, in, in the region in this case. We're at ground zero with uh, tourist arrivals and borders are still closed. 90% of our Pacific employees are impacted and the most vulnerable destinations are the Pacific nations whose GDPs are highly dependent on tourism such as Cook Islands, Tahiti, Fiji, etc. The SMEs are the hardest hit and according to the MFET SPTO report, potential financial impact over a 12 month period with the seven member countries that were uh, surveyed is in excess of 3.1 New Zealand billion, and this will pro this will increase with the impact prolonging. We are now experiencing in Fiji and most of our Pacific Island countries the impact on the wider economy, community, and society. So we anticipate a long road to recovery for our Pacific tourism industry and sector in the next uh, minimum probably five years. The tourism sector needs all the help we can receive uh, in moving forward. Um, from the COVID-19's negative impact on tourism sector highlights, there is a great need to re-emphasize why tourism matters to Asia Pacific SIDS. And this is from the lens of, of from the Pacific Islands. We are a resilient sector and are quick to recover. And through tourism, uh, uh, tourism in SIDS, can, it can be advanced in a sustainable way to provide a greater development impact in the region, particularly for local populations and economies. The sector can assist the SIDS to take better advantage of the blue economy, which is one of the one of our greatest assets in our Pacific region. It will also help implement the 2030 agenda and accelerate progress of SIDS towards achieving the 17 SDGs. SIDS development challenges can be met through the structural transformation of Pacific tourism, particularly in targeting niche products and high-end and environmental sustainable tourism services. The sector, of course, we all are aware of is a good drive of economic growth for many of our Pacific Island countries. I would also highlight the report's conclusions, which aligns well with SPTO's strategic plans, priorities, and our COVID-19 recovery plans. Asia Pacific seeds can take full advantage of their blue economy in a sustainable manner by developing the tourism sector. The second one is data is king for the tourism sector. Data remains a critical barrier to tourism development, particularly many of our countries do not have economic uh, impact data in this case. There's an urgent need to improve data quality, consistency, timeliness and coordination to inform future planning. And if tourism is to continue to be a driver of sustainable development, it requires stronger links and collaboration at all levels, from international to local communities and individuals. A key area is this is regional cooperation, which provides uh, an important um, 
factor to the value of SPTO and other crop agencies in the region. And SITs can act together to attract visitors, leverage their natural assets and gain collective bargaining power through economies of size and improved air and sea connectivity, which is a, one of our top challenges in our Pacific Island countries. With the issue of COVID-19, this remains a priority in the short term and it presents a timely opportunity for the world, for the Pacific and for tourism to advocate for change. The report aligns well with SPTO's COVID-19 recovery themes discussed at the recent SPTO roundtable held last Thursday. And I just wanna highlight this because uh, some of the re response recovery themes that fits in well with this report. In the stage of recovery, crisis management and building future resili resilience is of crucial importance. In the stage of response, diversification of products and markets are very important. And investing in creativity and innovation is crucial, whether it's partnerships, connectivity, and marketing, because the world is going to change, and we in the Pacific or even Asia Pacific cities need to change how we do things. And finally, in the area of endurance, preparing for the future. One of the key recovery themes there is building sustainable futures, focusing on sustainable tourism, SDGs and transforming to a circular economy. Thank you, Yosefa. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that uh, very clear uh, explanation of the uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on the tourism sector in the, in the Pacific Islands in particular, and, uh, and the, your views on, on, on what the report says. Uh, I, it is now my pleasure to uh, turn to Transform to respond to the recommendations on sustainable fisheries uh, in the report. Uh, over to you, Transform. You are you're muted. Unmute. Unmute uh, yourself for uh, transform. Oops. Transform, could you uh, unmute yourself, please? Struggling a bit here. Yeah. Well, Yosef, I apologize for that, um, Oliver and Chris and um, listeners throughout the Asia Pacific and wherever who's listening into this uh, presentation. First and foremost, let me thank um, UNSCAP for a very good report and it's timely uh, given the situation that we've, we're faced with at the moment, but I think more so for fisheries it's timely because you know there are certain important questions that we really need to ask ourselves not only about the state of state of the resource but also about what we can possibly do to enhance the economic opportunities around the extraction of our of our resources so i'd i'd like to just hone in on um, the, the recommendations that, that have been made and i think um, oliver you've done an excellent job in in covering um, quite a number of key things. Um, first and foremost, in the report, um, adequate conservation efforts is, is critical. But I, I would like to add, um, in addition to the very, you know, all the excellent um, suggestions that you've made, um, the idea that creating scarcity and limits and ensuring that we have restrictions in place 
uh, going to be an important component of the way in which we manage our fisheries resources. We, we cannot manage our fisheries resources in an open access, whether they're coastal fisheries, whether they're offshore fisheries. I think the impetus for, for, for management of fisheries is going to be ensuring that we manage, manage all our resources under some form of limits. Um, I think, you know, the whole idea, as you, as we all know, that managing our resources under open access arrangements um, is not going to work. And, and so, um, you know, all these other great ideas that we have about, um, you know, blue bond, um, bonds and, um, you know, taxing the ecosystems, which is, for me, uh, an important, very important idea, I think, that we need to, to take forward in that we are not also at, the, at this point in time um, factoring some of the ecosystem cost resulting from the extraction of our of our natural resources and I, I know that uh, one of the struggles that we have in the within the UN, UN system is that our accounting and st the statistical system is you know predetermined um, and so in measuring our gross domestic product um, we don't normally, view and value the ecosystem's value of and the contribution that the ocean has on, on livelihoods. And so we normally just tend to look at what the, the, the profit and the, the contribution is to the gross domestic uh, product. But um, I just wanted to say that I think creating, um, having limits first and foremost is, is, in, is important as a precondition to all the other things that we want to do in terms of enhancing conservation efforts, whether it's debt for conservation swaps and, and taxation and all those, I think underpinning um, management and underpinning any conservation effort is ensuring that we don't have an open, open access arrangement. I think that's where the challenge is for us. Um, in the offshore fisheries, you mentioned the, the the Western Central Pacific too. Now, I think we've been able to succeed somewhat in terms of ensuring that there are limits in place. But I think for many of our coastal fisheries, um, you know, apart from these territorial user rights, uh, we don't really have uh, limits in place in terms of um, the number of fish that you can actually take out of the of the water. And granted, I mean, it's not an easy it's not easy to really manage coastlines. Um, in Asia, in particular, has you know huge, huge challenges in terms of managing their um, their, their their coastlines and coastal fisheries. But um, there's been some very, very good work that's been going on, which comes down to the next next um, recommendation and next point that you make in the paper. And that's when you when you talk about factual, transparent, harmonized data and information. I think what you're really talking about is data is important for stock assessment. Data is absolutely cru cri uh, critical for for fisheries managers to be able to make decisions. And whether it's data in respect of coastal fisheries or data in respect of offshore fisheries, having access to that data in order to be able to translate that and then turn it into stock assessment so that we know exactly how much fish is in the water and then that for allows fisheries management to make decisions are important. Now, the question therefore, I think, is the investments and you, you um, I'm glad that the, the report um, alludes to in the recommendation that investments in technology, but I, I would actually go beyond just investing in technology. And I think the opportunity is, is investment in technology through partnerships between governments, between non-government non organizations, between communities, between inter-government uh, organizations like UN and, and the other uh, RFMOs that we have, and also tech, um, high tech companies. I think we should also recognize that the key drivers of technology are really not government and government institutions. You know, a lot of the research that is done around driving technology is done by the private sector themselves. And so, you know, there is, for me, you know, huge opportunities in, in ensuring that you can collaborate and develop these the strategic private-public sector partnerships uh, in order to 
enhance and work on remote sensing technology, uh, the work that's being done on electronic reporting and electronic monitoring. But here's, I think, the, the, the challenge that um, in, in terms of data. What you really want, whether it's dealing with offshore or nearshore resources, is what you really want is you want near real-time data. Because most of the stock assessment that's being done on our particularly on our tuna resources. And I, I'm not really sure if we do actually carry out a lot of stock assessment on our coastal fisheries. I, I doubt very much that there's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of like um, comprehensive um, region-wide data stock assessment on, on coastal fisheries. But what you really want is near real-time resources so that you're not relying on uh, data that is two to three years old in order to tell you what the state of their uh, stock is, which really is not the state of the stock as it is today, but it's the state of the stock two or three years ago. So, you know, you're not really um, building on um, you know, up-to-date information in order to be able to make effective fisheries management decisions. Um, I'm glad Glad you picked up on in the report on the issue of governance. You know, governance is absolutely critical. Um, but here's the story, I think, uh, in terms of um, overall governance and the effectiveness of governance. I think there is a feeling, a general feeling, that in order for our resources to be well managed, we need to move beyond governance that just in involves governments. Um, as key drivers, because the, the key drivers of fisheries management and international fisheries management also are the industry themselves um, and uh, environmental organizations. The market, the retail, they, they, they're playing a hugely influential role in, in shaping um, you know, um, the way in which um, management is, is made now. For example, many of these eco labels, um, the demands by consumers for better uh, accountability. Now we're seeing in the market demands for better treatment of crews. Um, and so these are all imperatives that are being driven largely by the consumers and the markets. So when we talk about governance, I think too often we tend to think of governance in terms of governments but there is a role to play and i i know it it it's not going to be easy but i think many of our regional institutions perhaps should be more open and more inclusive and maybe in, in involve the industry as partners in terms of um governance and government go government and, and decision making in terms of our of our resources um and finally You've made a very good point on regional cooperation. I mean, I think that's that's absolutely critical. It goes without saying, with the challenges we're facing with with climate change, uh, addressing plastics, marine pollution, debris, there, there is there's no way in which um, any company country can can work on their own, um, but to ensure that they they cooperate um, with each other. Um, I think. The cooperation that I'd like, I'd like to see between the Pacific Islands and, and our Asian region is my final point, is that we tend to, I think for me, I see the Asian countries in terms of our tuna resources, the fringe countries, it will be very powerful if we all brought um, ourselves under the same uh, framework and, and run the Vessel Day scheme. So thank you. I'll stop, stop there and... Um, be you know, happy to take any questions later on. Thank you very much. And congratulations for the report, Oliver, and um, Josef. This is an excellent report that I would commend to all of, all of you who are listening out. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Transform, for, for that very clear um, response to, uh, to what the report has to say. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you ended uh, with, with the comment on, on the role of regional cooperation uh, in, in, in fisheries and how fisheries uh, management can be enhanced through regional cooperation. Because one of the questions that we've got from, uh, from the audience is, is, is precisely that uh, regional cooperation key for Pacific 6 
uh, in developing tourism and fisheries. Uh, now, can I ask um, uh, Chris uh, to, to if he has any any, any view on, on, on how regional cooperation could enhance the, the sustainable development of, of uh, tourism in the Pacific Islands? Thank you, uh, Yosefa. I think uh, this is very important, uh, and uh, particularly I, I, I'm looking at from perspective of regional cooperation, linkages between the tourism sector with fisheries, agriculture, and all the other sectors that are available. And we're quite uh, blessed in tourism because we're multi sexual um, sector with a lot of linkages in this case. And that's not really happening in, in our Pacific region in this case. There's still uh, weak linkages between the different sectors. And I think the regional uh, cooperation will bring and enhance and strengthen these linkages amongst um, the the, uh, the different uh, different uh, region, regional organizations. And I think I'll also sort of further add on to that not only regional cooperation but linkages to Asia in this case as well as uh, the uh, other international partners because uh, we in the Pacific have very limited resources and we can't develop tourism on our own in this case. Uh, we need to cooperate with everyone that has um, the same interest and motive in this case in moving us forward. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. That question was from uh, Andres H. Uh, Bolesta, uh, a research analyst from the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Um, could I have a follow-up question uh, for you, Chris, uh, on, 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 on the necessity of the SITS venturing uh, into tourism industry, given the concerns uh, related to its harmful um, impact on, 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 on communities and the resources. So the question is, uh, do you see it as a necessary economic venture for SITS to engage in tourism industry? More often than not, tourism sector does more harm than good, displacement, exploitation, among others. These SITS also have fragile yet significant ecosystems. Thank you, Yosefa. And I, I think uh, this is when sustainable development comes into a key issue and well-planned tourism in this case, because the only reason why tourism will go off the track and, and have uh, negative impacts on our environment, even in uh, cultural issues, etc., is when it's not controlled and, and planned in this case. Eh? So the issue, and then that's why it's important that we also uh, link ourselves to driving the SDGs in this case, and also uh, the sustainable uh, issues that we, we we would like to 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 achieve, and I think it also comes down to awareness, uh, increasing awareness amongst our people, particularly the Pacific people, and even our visitors that come into the region. And we have a a, a promotional uh, slogan that we have is our, our our Pacific is yours, but also encouraging people to visit our region and respect as well as enjoy our region. And that's respecting our culture, respecting our environment, and respecting our people in this case. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chris. That question was from Avi Manejas. Unfortunately, we don't have the the, uh, the organization. Uh, but uh, sort of moving on to, uh, to back to transform uh, and uh, a question related to fisheries. Uh, the question is, how do we effectively address the challenges of overfishing and environmental degradation and to keeping fisheries more sustainable in the region? Okay. Well, I think first and foremost, this, this I always like to say that um, it's a natural resource and, you know, there are our, our fisheries resources are subject to what's known as natural recruit, re recruitment and you know fishing fishing recruitment. So there's mortalities that are associated with nature. So the fish, they spawn and then they die, and then we also catch, um, take them out of the water. So our real challenge is to ensure that we don't take, um, you know, we allow them to grow, but also at the same time we 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 don't take um, as much fish 
out of the water that we then you know reduce their their capability to uh, produce fast enough to and support our an economy, whether it's uh, you know profits of, of fishing boats, and so that is that is really the the challenge, and the it's exacerbated by the fact that um, first and foremost we don't actually see the fish underneath the water, and that is why I like your idea about transparency. Um, I made the point about making sure that you have near real time data so that your stock assessment is is based on what's actually happening underneath the water now rather than you know anecdotal uh, um, information that's two years old and you're making some decisions that are based on an assessment that's um, you know that's la that's that's outdated so you know that's I think the recommendation that you've made um, goes to improving the way in which we can then understand the fisheries and then make uh, urgent decisions. But just to answer the question, therefore, is that we as a we need to then find out, and those are the 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 rules called limit reference points and target reference points. And so, your 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 limit reference points really should be. Um, the level at which you don't want your stocks to go down. And for the key tuna stocks in the Pacific, I think we've done fairly well in terms of um, developing our limit reference points. And there's some very good, good work that's being done on defining what's known as your target reference points. And basically your target reference points are the, that's the level at which you want to keep your stock around um, and so you try and work with with your with other countries with your scientists with fisheries management to ensure that your stock is is maintained at a certain level now we've been successful in doing that for for tuna but i th think for many of our coastal fisheries it's harder to do as i mentioned earlier on it's harder to do you know refined uh, assessment and so i think that's where uh, some of our real challenges lie, uh, especially in our coastal fisheries where they are more subject to customary tenure. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot more diversity in the species that you have to manage. Um, and so it's, it's, it's far more complex to manage. Ironically, the, the, the fishery that is closest to securing and supporting our rural livelihoods and uh, food security than it is to manage commercial fishing that's happening far out at far out at sea. So yeah, um, I think those those are the those are really the I think some, those are the challenges that uh, fisheries managers are constantly having to 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 face in ensuring that the stocks remain at a certain level. Okay, thank you very thank much, you. Uh, Transformer. There's a, a related question while, while, while you're still on, uh, on on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on fisheries. Um, is there anything you would like to add uh, on that uh, to what Oliver had uh, already um, mentioned? Should I maybe jump in and then just uh, while um, um, Transform is looking at his microphone, you, you asked about the likely impact of COVID on, on uh, fisheries. Um, so I think I think it's still early days, but of course the, the COVID-19 pandemic is, is presenting a, a new area of challenges for the fisheries industry um, because we've, we're seeing a demand and potentially a supply stock at the same time, um, which will of course impact the livelihoods of, of fishermen but also people participating in the whole fisheries value chain um, which are under threat in the region um, the slowdown of fisheries is of course going to affect those countries that rely more heavily on ocean resources and and of course this includes all of the SIDS where, where fisheries is, is very important um, so the demand shock um, is going to be particularly ac uh, uh, acute because we're going to see um, the impacts of, of on people on boats, those who are away for extended periods of time, 
um, we might see a negative impact on stocks because there is a risk that there'll be a larger amount of um, illegal fishing simply because enforcement agencies would, would be occupied with uh, a number of domestic concerns during the pandemic. But maybe at the same time also one can have a, um, it might create a small window of opportunity for stocks to recover if there is actually a global slowdown of the commercial fishing industry um, as travel constraints are implemented and as access restrictions and ports are closed, um, which could lead to a decline in, in the um, activity of fishing vessels. So I'm not sure maybe if um, Transform would like to pick up on, on some other issues. Yeah, yeah, I think I think what COVID-19 has revealed for me is the business model and the disruptions in the supply chain, depending on the business model. So what we've seen in the Pacific is that those countries that have actually, those, those fishing operations that are purely, um, you know, long range distance water fishing nations who just come in and catch and then they have to go into port to then transship their catch. Are those, they're the ones whose operations have been most disrupted. Um, but those who have vertically integrated operations like Sol Tuna in Solomon Islands, um, who are processing, they they don't have, most of their crews are local crews. Um, they bring the fish back to port and therefore they then process it. And then they, you know, they've got their own markets and retailing platforms in, in Europe, um, have not been as affected. Which then raises for me, the interesting question for us in the Pacific Islands, um, you know, in this new normal, uh, it's it's revealing that it's obvious that um, those who are just simply relying on access fees as a means of generating revenue are the ones that are going to be most affected. And so there's opportunities for uh, improvements around things like traceability, digitization of the, the 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 business, and so you ensure that there's less disruption on the supply chain. But I think for me, you know, if I can just if I can be, um, you know, just say as as a Pacific Islander, um, I think this there is an opportunity for us to then explore our own bubble in in some ways and develop. Um, and an industry in which we can promote cross-border investments so that instead of having to rely on these uh, in um, fishing, long-range distant water fishing nations that then come in and then transship their catch to Thailand and, and Ecuador, um, there's an opportunity for us to um, have our, 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 our tuna that's caught in the region processed in Solomon Islands, in, in PNG and in Fiji, maybe in American Samoa. We've already got canneries in, in the region. And so COVID-19 has revealed to us that the traditional business model of access fees and selling licenses is actually one that is not is the one that's more most affected by by COVID-19, and therefore, I think there's an opportunity for for us to explore different ideas and different ways in which. And I think that to me, it's quite empowering um, if we were to be able to explore that, and um, you know, just imagine um, increasing the domestic production of canned tuna, um, but that that is jointly produced by the Pacific Island country, so. Yeah. All right, uh, thank Thanks, you very much. Uh, thank you, Transform. And uh, perhaps staying with uh, the fisheries uh, and, and the comment uh, made uh, early on about uh, bonds and, uh, and, and, and green taxes. So there is a question, uh, perhaps I can post this to both uh, Oliver and, and, and Transform. Um, the report uh, highlights the issuance of the world's first sovereign blue bond by the Republic of Seychelles. Can Asia Pacific six replicate this success? That's Oliver first. Uh, okay, sure. Thank you very much. Yes, um, we, we do mention in the report that the Seychelles is one of the first countries that well, it is actually the first country that launched a, a sovereign blue bond um, and it raised, I think, around a total of $15 million to advance its, its blue economy. Um, I think this is definitely something that could be replicated um, in other countries. Um, I mean, just maybe not everyone is familiar with what a blue bond is, but um, blue bonds are essentially innovative 
ocean financing instruments where um, they raise funds that are exclusively used for for projects that are deemed to be ocean friendly um, and and i think seychelles has led the way here but but um, I'm, I'm sure a number of other countries are, are looking at that in the region um, I, as far as I know, Fiji has been looking more closely at blue bonds, how to issue blue bonds. Um, it's, of course, linked also to capital market development in countries. I think maybe for some of the very much smaller SIDs, it could be tricky. One has to, does have to have a certain degree of capital market development. Um, but but uh, that's something that SCAP is actually um, looking into also in, in our financing for development section. Over back to you. Thank you. Um, Transform, did you want to say anything? Okay, so while, while Transform is trying to, uh, to uh, sort out these preps, we can move on to, uh, to Chris uh, and ask the question about uh, the, um, the waste related to COVID-19, whether that has become an issue in, 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 in the Pacific. Uh, you know, the, uh, like the waste uh, that, 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 that um, have got to do with, uh, with the medical uh, equipment and, uh, and the face masks and, uh, and, 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 and the likes. And is that, is that something that is uh, uh, becoming an issue in the Pacific uh, from the point of view of, uh, of, of, of free and cleaning, clean environment for tourism? Uh, thank you, Yosef. Um, to answer your que question, frankly, uh, we have not yet received any uh, any um, information on race related uh, because of COVID-19 um, masks, etc. But it's something that we can also work and check with SPRIP on, uh, particularly on, on the waste that's created by that. But uh, one of the things that we've experienced, because the whole world has come to a standstill uh, with no traveling, etc., and all this, um, the wastage factor from, from cruise ships uh, and all these other key, uh, even airlines, etc., have come to a stop in this case, which is a blessing to our environment. But uh, we have yet to see anything from, from what you have highlighted on waste from uh, COVID-19 uh, um, resources. Okay. Uh, you said, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, I, I was just going to say that in terms of the opportunity for, for investments in, in blue bonds, I think there is an opportunity for those countries who are, are parties to the NARU agreement for the vessel days. And so maybe I think there's there's been some attempt um, collectively for uh, a project to, to look at the capitalization they call it a capitalization project. Unfortunately, that did not go very far uh, in terms of um, the enthusiasm by by the office and also I think a number of countries. But having said that, there is still an opportunity um, for countries, individual countries to perhaps look at the vessel day, day and maybe capitalize it, convert it. Um, into um, a national asset so that it does show as part of the, uh, it could show as part of the books um, and maybe use it to leverage um, and use it as collateral for, for loans um, and blue bonds and, and so on and so forth. So um, it's an idea that I have actually sold, I've sold to our Minister for Finance, but there's, bit, there's some analysis that, that can be done behind that to see whether or not it will work. But I think there is some some real opportunities to, to do that. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Transform. While I, uh, while I have you on, the, on, 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 on my uh, Transform, you know, your, your comment early on about the more sort of uh, uh, domestic-based uh, uh, industry or, or development uh, based on, on, on the islands, are there any limitations to that strategy that uh, um, can be addressed or, or, or should be addressed? I, we have six canneries in the islands. So there's four, I think, in PNG. There's one in Solomons, Fiji, uh, and American Samoa. So we do have 
Um, I don't know whether we have capacity to, to convert all the tuna that's caught in our waters, um, you know, you know, in the canneries that we have, but we do actually have the capacity. And I think the real challenge for us is to start accepting that this possibility for cross-border investments amongst ourselves in the islands. So those are the real hurdles, um, Yosefa, is, is policy, and generally speaking, I think uh, a change in the business model, um, people being comfortable, generally countries are, are comfortable with simply selling, selling licenses. And so it would require uh, a bit of a change in focus. Um, but I like to think that with COVID-19, um, it's telling us that we have to change, that we have to be searching for new ways in which we uh, do business. And so the, the business where the fishing vessel, their operations are, are disrupted because of port restrictions, because we can't get observers, is not going to work for us. Any, um, we might be, if we allow that to continue, then there are trade-offs to be made. For example, we might have to weaken some of our conservation management measures. We might have to allow um, you know, more flexibility. And therefore, if we do that, then you, know, you invite more, we don't know, we might invite illegal, uh, unreported fishing in the region when other people are doing it. And so that is why I think for us, the opportunity is if we, if we manage it ourselves, then um, I think we would be able to better control. There are, there are, of course, um, you know, the question of of who's going to invest, what are the costs, uh, etc. But I think there are many different ways of skinning the skinning the cat. I mean, I think you know we don't have to own the boats; we can contract the boats, we can charter the boats. So you can. There are many different ways in which you reduce your cost, but you increase the opportunities that come back to you. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you very much, uh, Transform. Uh, I've, got, I've got to receive the message from the Director General of uh, Foreign Fisheries Agency, um, noting that uh, I'd like to share with you uh, that regional cooperation has been the cornerstone of the success of the Pacific, especially uh, through the Foreign Fisheries Agency in the tuna fisheries sector in the Pacific. Uh, it, that it cannot be overstated as the platform to capitalize on the opportunities presented by COVID-19 pandemic and to build back better, both in fisheries and the tourism sector. Perhaps so this is a, perhaps a good, uh, good, good, good uh, segue into asking um, the question, uh, you know, what, um, what do you highlight as, as, as a key element of building back better in, 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 in both fisheries uh, and, and, and tourism? Perhaps, uh, to Chris first uh, from tourism uh, and then um, transform on, on, on COVID-19. Um, by the way, before you do that, um, the, um, the Director General also asked a question about, the, about this. Uh, what the pandemic has highlighted with significant sectors such as tourism and hospitality being severely impacted as underlined by the SPTO Executive Director, Chris, the enduring resilience provided by our fish resources for economic development and food security. So how do we not maintain our economic and social returns from our fisheries resources, but also en enhance them? So uh, in, 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 a, in a quick response on what you what you take as the key highlights in uh, building that better strategy after COVID-19 in tourism and fisheries. Chris first, and then maybe Oliver after, after you too. Yeah, th thank you, Yosef. I think uh quite simply and also just uh, reiterating what I said in, in my presentation. Um, it, it's basically crisis management and building future resilience because uh, uh, we need to build our resilience because there may be uh, future pandemics or even uh, more natural uh, um, disasters that may come in the future. Uh, diversification is very important and innovation, uh, especially when the world has definitely changed and need to change the way we're doing things. And, and finally, I think uh, building sustainability or sustainable futures uh, and, and looking at uh, sustainable tourism 
SDGs and also transform into more circular economy. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I've, I've been. I'm struggling a little bit with my, with internet access and and broadband. So I've actually missed a lot of what's been, what's been said earlier on, and you've all all gone off the screen too for for me. But um, yeah, I, I actually missed the point that you made earlier on. Um, I'm just assuming that the comment made by Manu was pointing out the importance of regional cooperation. I think um, I just wanted to say yes, it is an it, it is an important um, I think point. But I think maybe just to point out also that um, you know there are certain things that for which we can we can cooperate more successfully than others. Um, I think in terms of compliance and enforcement, that is a, a very um, critical critical. Um, you know, we've been able to succeed in in um, in in cooperating through effective developing effective um, uh, conserv um, monitoring, control, and surveillance measures. I think my recent um, more recently, though, um, we have not been as successful in terms of developing, um, for example, the the Southern Albacore group are still it's still a work in progress. Whereas you've got the PNA who've been very successful with with Skipjack. So you've got um, you know you don't have one size that that fits all. So when we when we develop these regional measures, we always have to ask ourselves, you know, what is the common currency that uh, that countries or, or grouping of countries um, have, for instance. So um, cooperating with Indonesia and Philippines, for example, might not be in the interest of all the Pacific Island countries, might just be in the interest of some of those who have, uh, you know, with skip, share a common interest with Skipjack. Um, but there might be other areas that you could perhaps um, collaborate with the Asians. So I, I don't know if you picked that up, um, Josefa, I do sincerely apologize. My screen and um, sound system is really <laughs> playing up. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, thank, thank you, Transform. Uh, could I just check with Oliver if, if, if things are, are okay from that, from your side, because um, something is, is happening with my screen as well. Oliver, can you, can you hear? Yes, everything is fine from this side. Thank you. All right. So there, there, there is a, another question uh, that was uh, meant for uh, what transform, uh, which is uh, what would be your view on increasing value added for tuna fisheries for Pacific Islands, given that the uh, price of tuna can vary widely depending on how you fish, how you process, etc. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. Maybe. I'll answer that question in two parts. First, I will do a bit of self-promotion um, and also point out that there is a lovely book that was launched last Friday by the Australian National University, um, authored by um, one Transform Mangarao, in which we exp in which I I looked at the the way in which we increased the value of tuna from 60 million to half a billion. Um, from 2010 to 2017, and they're in. Uh, some, but I think the. Hello, Oliver. I think Transform has muted himself. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, yeah. 
Thanks, Paul. Okay. Um, yeah. If I if I can just say the. Um, in order to do that, I think that the most important thing in order to increase revenue is to look at the look at the design of the instrument that you have. And for now, we have the vessel day scheme. And so I limits and created a, a separate market that is distinct from the price of the price of the fish. And so um, I that that particularly, um, you know, they've been able to the PNA have been able to do that quite successfully, but I think it can this potential for to look at other things like transferability with the other uh, Pacific Island countries and also Asian countries. Um, I think, but the important thing is 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 in the design of of the instrument. Thanks, thanks, uh, Yosef. Oh, all right, um, thank you, um, Transform. I just wanted to check with Oliver if he has anything to add uh, to that. Uh, no, I wouldn't have anything to add at the moment, so thank you. All right, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Chris, um, there, there is a, a question about the, uh, you mentioned something about the the response uh, to COVID-19 being being that of uh, diversifying the tourism uh, sector. Uh, do you think there's enough of that being done at the moment uh, with the rush to uh, open up uh, the, the borders and, and, and to get back to, to normal? Uh, thank you, Yosefa. And I think um, uh, just to reiterate the diversification, it's diversification of our source markets. At the moment, you, most of our tourism uh, arrivals are from Australia and New Zealand uh, to the Pacific, which is around 50%. So that's diversifying to other markets because when it happens, when, um, when crisis happens like this, uh, of course, uh, our closest neighbors, um, there's, uh, the borders are still closed in this area. And also the diversification of our products. And at the moment, most of our tourists are just focused on leisure tourists, which is sun, sand, sand and sea. So in that area, there's, there needs to be more done in diversifying into niche products, whether it's cruise-based or marine-based or sports tourism-based, et cetera, or culture-based. So there needs to be uh, more diversification. And I think it's, it's a process um, that we'll go through as well as um, uh, learning from best practices and experiences that are happening. And under um, uh, SPTO's new strategic plan, there is a encouragement for diversification. And also we are currently uh, developing a regional sustainable framework that will also help that as well, particularly um, the, the niche market segments looking at high value, low impact. Uh, and, and trying to move the, tour the tourism industry from just uh, looking at um, high volume, low uh, uh, high volume, low yield to high value and a, a low impact. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, the, the, the report does raise um, some questions about the uh, actual impact or the value of, of cruise, uh, cruise uh, tourism. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say about that, uh, Chris? Um, uh, yes, um, if uh, just for the benefit of our, our listeners as well, 90% uh, of the cruise arrivals in the Pacific are just focused on three countries, which is New Caledonia, Vanuatu and Fiji in this case. So it's very unevenly distributed. So there's an, an, a, a need to actually distribute this more evenly amongst our countries. Um, the issue of... Uh, uh, a niche cruise or whether it would be things like expedition cruising is somewhere something that also should be further developed and encouraged in our region in this case. At the moment, uh, the crews that come into our Pacific Island countries are large cruise ships, etc. But there is a move as well of our cruise, uh, cruise companies trying to work closely with the respective island countries as well as SPTO to become more environmentally responsible in this case. And, and it is also part of our of our regional sustainable framework in this case. Um, but I think um, there's time to be spent on uh, on 
on on the sh on the shore as well that um, I think one of the key other areas particularly for cruise tourism is uh, how much time the visitor spends on shore as well as spending as well uh, so if, uh, if that means that if they have more activities to spend in uh, and also a duration of the time they spend so that there is also more um, value of, of in terms of what they can uh, contribute to the to the respective islands. All right, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, let me now thank uh, all our panelists and uh, our experts for their contribution, Chris and Transform, and of course, uh, Oliver, for their, their contribution today. I'm afraid that is all uh, we have time for today. Uh, for the audience, our listeners, if you have further questions, uh, do send us email, scas at un.org. Uh, let me now hand over to my colleagues to say their goodbyes. Oliver? Yes, I'd like to thank um, also Chris and Transform. Thanks for participating in this launch of the report. And uh, thank you, Josefa, for, for moderating this. Um, it's It's been a long road to bring this report out, but uh, it's, it's uh, something we'll carry on disseminating the report um, through individual policy dialogues in some of the Pacific countries and, and also uh, the two SIDS which are outside of the Pacific. Um, so we hope to get some some of our key messages across and uh, we look forward to work, working, working with you in the future. So thank you very much. And uh, of course, thank you to the viewers for watching and, and posing some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to our viewers. Goodbye. Thank you.